Okay, Diana, can you hear and see? All right. Let's start again. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get on the record. You are back on the record. Okay, good morning, everyone. We have, um, it's Thursday, April 30th, and it's nine o'clock. We have all three commissioners with us for our OBM meeting this morning. Uh, they are, both of the commissioners are remote. Um, we have also with us in the room, and we're gonna start with Phil McGrain and work around the room. Phil McGrain, clerk. Cassie Porter, Ranger. Melissa Moody, Administrative District Judge. Beth Mott, Treasurer. Sandra Arias, Trial Court Administrator. Bush Bush Trial Operations. Mike Work, Operations. Jake Matar, Media County Procurement. Bob Perkins, Media County Procurement. Can you hear everyone in the room? Yeah, your well. people in the room, not very well. Okay, Bob, go ahead, Bob McQuaid. Bob McQuaid, assessor. Okay, Erica. Erica White, prosecutor's office. And Steve R. Nope, Sheriff. Steve Bartlett, Sheriff. Okay, and we have Kimberly. Kimberly Link, Central District House. Okay, um, hi Kim, good morning. And then we have a call in. Is that, is Russ on, Russ Duke? Yeah, I'm on, thank you. Oh great, okay, is there anyone else on who's not stated your name for the record? It's like, that's it, okay. We're gonna try to move through the agenda pretty quickly. Um, we have uh, Russ Duke and Kim Link from Central District Health with us uh, as the last item today. So hang tight, it won't take us too long to get through the agenda here. All right, we're gonna start with uh, changes to the agenda. And we do have changes to the agenda. Um, Commissioner Lachiondo, would you care to make a motion on those changes? I am, however, Madam Chair, I'm only going to uh, do part of the amendment. Um, Madam Chair, I move to amend the agenda to add item four, paren uh, 15B, emergency health pay discussion. I will not be adding the agreement number 13744. Okay, we'll just need a motion then for the one added item. Uh, we have that motion, we'll need a second. Second. Okay, we have a motion, a second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Aye, we can barely hear you guys, so make sure you speak into your microphones. Okay, the ayes have it, motion carries. Now we're going to take up new business and we're going to start with operations. We have a change order, and this change order apparently is for faces, faces of hope on a remodel agreement 13704, and it's a decrease of $984.70. Bruce, did you wanna make any comments on this? Uh, Mike, Mike? Uh, yeah, this change order will reduce the fixed contract price uh, to the original contract in the amount of $984.70 due to the fact that we had unused contingency allowance money on this project, so this will return that money back to the county. Okay, great, thank you. Any questions for operations or for Mike specifically? Okay, I'll need a motion on that. Commissioner, Commissioner Lachiando. Madam Chair, I move to approve the change order number one as listed on the agenda and authorize the chair to sign the documents on behalf of the board. Now we can hear you. <laughs> great, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Aye, the ayes have it, motion carries. Next up, licenses. Commissioner Malloy, would you care to make a motion on the licenses? Well, Madam Chair, I move to approve and ratify the licenses as listed on the agenda, including 108 license renewal, and authorize the chair to sign the document on behalf of the board. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye, the ayes have it, motion carries. Looks like people are getting ready to ramp up and open their businesses, all these licenses, it's great. Good news, okay, clerk's office next. All right, uh, Phil McGrain is here with us, good yeah, morning. Yeah, uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I think m many of you, if not all of you, have probably seen the news as of late. Uh, this has been one of the more trying elections that I've been through. Um, that's just the best way for me to describe it. We're working hard, I think in the, in the grand scheme, um, a lot is going very well, um, but we had a hiccup um, with a batch process. The Secretary of State's office ran for us. They oversimplified their programming, and it resulted in just almost 5,000 people getting the wrong ballot. They're getting nonpartisan ballots rather than the ballot they should. 
Um, I anticipate that the new ballots will be being mailed today. Um, we've been working on a solution throughout the week, um, spending quite a bit of time doing that. So we'll have new ballots out. Um, in total, we're at 60,000 uh, ballots that have uh, been requested so far and issued. Um, that's very significant compared to what we typically see. Um, I do know that starting over the weekend, starting Monday, uh, those voters who haven't requested a ballot will start getting absentee cards uh, in the mail. There were some delays on those. Um, COVID-19 is affecting all sorts of aspects of this. Um, but so the election is well underway, a lot of attention. There's three weeks uh, until election day. So we encourage anybody who hasn't requested their ballot to do so, but given the numbers that we've seen in terms of people typically would vote in this election, most have already requested a ballot, um, but we are still bracing. We've got uh, still a number of court staff and others out at elections working. Um, we've got 14 additional people on top of our full-time election staff uh, kind of working hard on that. And then we're working with the courts and others, as you well know, to get everything else start to be opened back up. So how does that 60,000 compare to prior years? Uh, four <laughs> years ago, uh, there was a total of 35,000 people who voted in total. Almost double, wow. Yeah, <clears throat> so Busy. big numbers. Yeah, great. Any questions? No, oh, Pat, yeah, Here. Commissioner Malloy. Phil, I was wondering how, how are, is there gonna be any unsurmountable issues with spoiled or lost ballots for people that may have misplaced or, you know, I know we always have a spoiled ballot concern. Um, how is that? How are you addressing that? Or is it any different? Um, I don't think so. You know, the good news is we've been able to account for everything and, and add in additional controls for this election. Um, if people, we've had people who've had issues, you know, if they misplaced them, we just reissue a new ballot. Um, thankfully, this is all happening so early in the process. I think that's one of the things we've learned is what one of the most significant contributing factors to the challenges we faced this election is that we had two days notice and all of a sudden we had to change our operations entirely. Um, to put into perspective, um, the state of Oregon, which does an all mail election, um, they just started mailing their first ballots, I think it's the middle of this week. So we've been mailing ballots for a while, doing kind of doing it the way we're traditionally structured, which isn't the probably the most appropriate way for an all mail election as opposed to doing it similar to states that do this all the time. Um, and so, we're, and that scramble seems to be one of the contributing things. But in terms of spoiled, I've had people call, we, we can issue new ballots. The bigger issue, I think that people have concerns or questions is we're now gonna have um, roughly, probably about eight, a little over 8,000 people who will be issued two ballots, right? And so how do we make sure that people don't vote twice um, but we have an entire process in this. We've given instructions to everybody who's gotten a new ballot in terms of what to do. They can discard the original. But even if they do turn them both in, we're actually matching those up, uh, every single one of them, so that we only count one ballot, so which we, with the one that we know is the appropriate ballot that should be counted. And so we've got a whole back-end process that we'll be working through, and we'll be doing some media and other stuff to educate the public on what we're doing to maintain the accuracy and the security of this election. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't envy you your position right now. <laughs> Good job. Thank though. you. Yeah. Anything else? We move on. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else from your office, Phil? Um, I'll just mention we've got a little over two hundred, uh, about two hundred fifty licenses uh, still outstanding to be renewed. I know you guys are seeing lots of renewals, uh, so we've but we've got another month to get those done, and we're working with those uh, businesses to get that done. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to Claims Journal. I'll, I'll need a motion for the Claims Journal. Um, Commissioner Belay? Yes, and I'm looking for that. Oh, here we go. Madam Chair, I move to ratify and uh, the authorization made on Tuesday, April 28th, 2020, uh, to pay the claims on the Claims Journal dated. April 24th, 2020. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Aye, the ayes have it, motion carries. Next up, I'll need a motion for the tax cancellations. Commissioner Lachiondo. Oh, I'm sorry, personal I'm action sure. forms. I don't look like I have per that motion. I have personal action personal. forms next. Personal. Yeah. personal action forms next. Madam Chair, I move to approve the personal action forms as listed on the agenda, including two introductory period pay completions, three leaves with pay, and that the summary sheet remain on file in the commissioner's office. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Ayes have it. The motion carries. Now we have the assessor's office. And Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Malloy. Just on, just on that last one, I want to I want to assure the public too that a lot of these, you know, they've probably been hearing and seeing a lot of leads would pay, and it, and it took me a while to get completely up to speed on how that was being handled. But to up to this point. All of this has been covered by CARES and FMLA and things of that nature, and much of it will hopefully be reimbursable to the county. Thank you. And Cassie from HR is here. If anyone has any questions, Mr. Malloy should be able to answer those uh, down the agenda here. Thank you. All right. So we had personal action forms. Next up, we have the assessor's office. We have Assessor McQuaid with us uh, on the bridge. Good morning. Madam Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. All right. I'm, I'll, I'll make this brief. I know it's, uh, we have other uh, speakers. Um, we had uh, some deadlines in the past. The PTR project in Township. This year we had, uh, to date, we have 3,719. Last year, at the end, we had 3,800, uh, 3,900. So we're down a little bit, but we still have 44 days. To go and we expect to see uh, a surge after we send out assessment notices. People will realize that they have not uh, had filed PTR, and fortunately, this year they will have time to file. So we expect that to go up. Uh, we're working on opening the offices next week. We're going to have employees uh, start returning to work. And then the 18th is what we're looking at for our opening to the public. That would be the admin division and the PT, uh, driver's license. Uh, Sorry, Chef, motor vehicle license. And uh, we're, we have a process in place for doing that. We're preparing the assessment wall. This is going to be a quick twist in one. Uh, we've never prepared a wall like we have right now, but we have three weeks left until we send out assessment notices. Uh, we're running over 100 queries, make different tests, make sure everything is okay. Uh, everyone assures me that the roll is going to go out well and we shouldn't have any significant problems, even though. Where our processes were, were very, very different than they have been in the past. And I just wanted to just, just give a very brief, uh, just a couple of marks on the real estate market, what I see. There is nothing in print. I can't find anything in the Wall Street Journal or other locations. I'm getting my information from appraisers, our appraisal staff, and also realtors. Uh, we know the market is really a strong month. Real estate was up about 10% year over year. Uh, the market seems to be steady, the same thing the residential market does. Uh, there are some signs of weakening. Uh, I was talking to a real estate agent, one of the, the better known real estate agents. Uh, she said that the, uh, the offers are coming in about one and a half percent less than the asking price. Typically, that's just the opposite of what we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, the uh, offers have been over the, uh, the asking price. There are fewer showings going on. Uh, it's taking longer to finish homes. I think I mentioned this before cabinets, countertops, painting are taking considerably longer and it's, uh, nobody really quite understands the reason it's, it's not necessarily tied to the uh, to the epidemic but uh, it's just it's a fact that's out there some builders have, have stopped pouring foundations other ones are are keep going so it's it's still really early to tell uh, where the market's going to go but there are some signs that it is slowing down a little bit but we, i don't expect to see a, a crash at all so madam chairman and commissioners that's for this morning. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Appreciate sure. that. Commissioner Lachiando. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember, uh, Assessor McQuaid, if we discussed this before. Uh, we, it seems to me we have a, a unique opportunity this year, given, as you noted, that uh, assessments are going out. The property tax reduction isn't due, uh, application isn't due until June 15th. I'd be interested, and we can take this conversation to the next meeting, but i um, interested in looking at what would it look like to do an insert? Um, in the assessment notices, highlighting that program. Um, obviously, there's a cost associated with that, but given the struggles we know people are going to be potentially having this year, it might be might be worth it for us to continue to market that program. So we can discuss further. Thank uh, you. Can we remark in response to uh, Commissioner Lachiano? Of course. We are preparing an insert, and one of the items of that insert is a reminder that PTR, we're still accepting applications. Right. Thank you. Thanks. We're ahead of Commissioner Lachiano on something. Awesome. 
All right, any further questions for Assessor McQuaid? No, okay, we'll go ahead then and we'll move on to tax cancellations. Commissioner Lechianda, would you care to make a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the tax cancellations as listed on the agenda, which includes two tax cancellations for 2017, two cap tax cancellations for 2018, and nine tax cancellations for 2019, and authorize the chair to sign the documents on behalf of the board. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye, the ayes have it, motion carries. Next up, Treasurer's Office. Ms. Mon, come on up. Beth, how are you? Good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, good. All right. Any report from your office this morning? Well, in the Treasurer's Office, for the most part, um, it's business as usual um, in our unusual environment. <laughs> um, it's, of course, month end, um, but really proud of our staff. We're able to do most of these tasks remotely. Um, so we're just gearing up for month end. Also, we are um, gearing up for the second half property tax bills. That's for the 2019 payment that's due, due June 22nd. Um, so we will promptly process the cancellations that were just approved. That's important for accurate account balances. Um, otherwise, um, we look forward to working with the other offices on reopening plans that are safe and consistent with the guidance we've received. And if folks need to get a hold of your office, they can um, call, email, <clears throat> and then also you mentioned that you have a chat uh, chat box now? Correct. We do have a chat box. Um, we've had, received several chats, and the feedback we've gotten from taxpayers who've used it is either the five stars or even they note in the comment, love this feature. Thank you for this new service. Excellent. Good. We'll continue to get that information out to folks. We will. Good. Any questions? No? Thank you, Beth. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, yeah. have a great day. Okay, next uh, I need approval of minutes. Commissioner Malloy, would you care to make a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes as identified on the agenda and authorize the Chair to sign the documents on behalf of the board. You need a second? Second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up, uh, Weed and Pest. Do we have anyone here from Weed and Pest? I do not see Adam here. So we have a release of uh, a lien, and I'll need a motion, Commissioner Laciando. Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve one release of lien for weed and pest as listed on the agenda and authorize the chair to sign the documents on behalf of the board. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Aye, aye. ayes have it, motion carries. Next up, I need a motion for uh, the agreements as listed on the agenda, Commissioner Laciando. <clears throat> Chair, and based on uh, that we did not add that additional agreement, it looks like we have five agreements at this point. So I will move to approve uh, the five agreements as listed on the agenda and offers the chair to sign the appropriate documents on behalf of the board. Is it five or is it six when we take that one out? I think it's six agreements. We're omitting D. One, two, three. It's just uh, one, two. It's just five because I did not add the um, that additional agreement when we um, made changes to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Oh no, you're there's right. It's six because so there's one on the top here. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Go ahead and make the motion. I'll do that again. Madam Chair, I move to approve the six agreements as listed on the agenda and authorize the chair to sign the appropriate documents on behalf of the board. Here we go. Okay. Second. What? Okay, we have a <clears throat> motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. And Madam Chair, I just want to clarify before I cast my uh, vote that I do understand now that the one agreement between Ada County and the City of Boise is specifically coming from the indigent services budget line item. So I aye. That is correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor, state aye. We did. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up, indigent services. And I'll need a motion. Anyone here from indigent? No? Okay, we'll need a motion. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Malloy. Madam Chair, I move, uh, I move to accept the recommendations of indigent services staff as listed on the summary of the case dated April 30th, 2020, and authorize the chair to sign the appropriate documents on behalf of the board. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Aye, the ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up, procurement. Welcome, Bob. How are you? 
Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Doing well. Thank you for yeah. asking. Looks like we have two openings of uh, bid 20041 and 20047. Yes, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, could you make sure to have Bob come and speak into the microphone? Yeah, do you want to sit oh, over here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we have uh, two openings before you, uh, before the board this morning. Uh, the first one is opening up bid 20041, the Ada County Coroner's Office Cooler Freezer Expansion Project. And uh, Jacob's going to share the screen with everybody. This will be uh, an opening on bonfire. And so. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning. Sometimes it takes a minute. You need to be wearing your mask, Luke. Thank you. It's got a picture of you. <laughs> You have to be the host to share. You have to so be. Sharing right now. We're seeing his computer on our screens. You are seeing it. At least I. That's right. So I'll have to switch. Do we have before we do that? Are we? Do we have Russ set up to go? Central District Health presentation. It'll be the same way as this. It'll be the same. Okay. I'm just going to have them go first. I'm not sure what we're missing. We can see the okay. procurement site. On our side, we uh, can't see the. Uh, we can't see it to read it. Yeah, they're missing it in the room, I believe. I'm going to mute here. I'm going to mute here. So if uh, I can proceed with the opening if one of the other commissioners can see it on their end. Okay. Can one of you, yeah, can, can Commissioner Malay, can you see it on your end? <laughs> We've lost him. Yeah, we do our crickets. <laughs> That's a feedback. Everyone see bonfire? Please say yes. No one can hear me. Can they hear Jacob? You want to say something, Jacob? Hello. You're, you're going to have to speak probably really quite loudly. Luke, just let us know what you want us to do. Okay, try now. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everyone hear Bob Perkins? Say yes. It should be on. So you muted that one. Yes. That one's on. That one was muted. Use this one here. That's. I can join with audio. <clears throat> I have it turned off right now. <clears throat> can you hear me now? Can you hear us now? Yes. All right. Okay. Can everyone hear Bob Perkins? Go ahead, Bob. Can you hear me okay? Commissioner Malloy? Anybody hear me? Bob McQueen gave a thumbs up. Okay. It's just Bob. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. you can. All right. Okay, go ahead and proceed. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Commissioners, for your patience this morning. Uh, so, uh, like I was saying, we have uh, before you the opening of bid 20041, the Ada County Coroner's Office Cooler Freezer Expansion Project. We received five responses for this uh, oh, uh, project. Great. And um, <laughs> what a thought. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, if you're ready for us to unseal the bids, uh, Jacob will unseal them. Great. All right, Jacob. So Madam Chair, up there you have uh, the five uh, contractors and their bids uh, off to the uh, right-hand side of that. All right, we're going to start with Anderson Construction Company of Idaho, LLC, $673,415. Next, we have CRC Design Build Systems, LLC, and that looks like it's $792,000. Then we have EKC, Inc., and that is $677,900. And then we have Excelsior Construction Company at $712,500. Finally, we have Wright Brothers, the building company, at $826,667. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had to get up there so I could see it. No glasses. Um, so, so uh, no glasses. <laughs> thank you for reading those into the record. Uh, we're going to need a little time to evaluate these bids, and uh, we would request that this be uh, tabled for award recommendation to the May 5th, 2020 Open Business Meeting. Great. Commissioner Lechanda, would you care to make that motion? Commissioner Malloy, would you care to make that motion? Yes. When, uh, May when 5th. Did you want to, how much time did you want to review these? May 5th. May 5th. Madam Chair, I move to table the award of bid 20041. Ada County Corners Office Cooley Freezer Expansion Project until May 5th, 2020. Commissioner Lodgiando, will you second that? I think we've dropped her, so I'll second that. Um, all those in favor, state aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion carries. All right, next Sorry, up. I muted myself because I have cloud <laughs> children. All right, we have a uh, second uh, opening of bid 20047, Bob. Yes, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, we have bid opening for uh, bid 20047, the Ada County Landfill Wellhead Conversion and Gas Feeding Purchase 2020. And uh, Madam Chair, uh, if you're ready for us to unseal those, we will. Please. All right, Jacob, Thank you, go Jacob. ahead and unseal it. Uh, Madam Chair, we're looking uh, for the name of the bidder today. And we, ha we have six divisions uh, that we have before you uh, for each of the divisions for the different components for the land hill the landfill wellhead um, project. And uh, the first one will be the HDPE pipe division. Okay. Let's hope my laptop doesn't die. All right, we have to unseal them all individually. That's okay. <laughs> also, Madam Chair, um, there is a uh, six divisions and in, in, in the interest of time if you wanted to we could just read the uh, names of the bidders okay and uh, and then ahead. it'll be on the record for yep. Yep. folks to look at if they choose to do so yeah it may take us a little while to work through each of these divisions. okay so i'll just read the names of the bidders then yeah so jake let's just go to the bidders and read those okay. on the record thank you All right, the bidders, we have Core and Main, and we have Dot Energy Solutions, Inc., and we have ISCO Industries. Perfect. All right, thank you. All right. Hey, yes, go ahead, Commissioner Malloy. Um, when I, and just for public clarity and my own clarity, when I see wellhead, I think water, but I also see gas fitting. So could we have a little explanation on specifically what this is? Yeah, we don't have Bruce. Do you want to go ahead and speak to that briefly? Yes, yeah, for um, come I on up. It. It's, it's for the uh, come oh. on up and just go ahead and speak loudly, <laughs> uh, Madam Chair. I believe this is for the uh, landfill gas capture. All these modifications to uh, bring up that uh, landfill gas. Touch gas. 
it, it's a wellhead. It's a wellhead for uh, supplying gases to the appropriate generators. Um, yes, uh, generators, generators and the uh, burn-off facilities. Okay, to be converted to energy again. I just for my own personal edification, but also for public clarity, we're not we're not digging a water well out of the landfill. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> not today. No. <laughs> Water. I'm sure our friends at Central District Health might have something to say about that, actually. Yeah, Russ, we're getting to you. We're trying to get through it here. Okay, let's go ahead, Bob, then. Uh, we'll need time. You'll need time. Yes, Madam Chair, we'll need okay. a little time to uh, review the bids, and we would request that this also be tabled to the uh, May 5th, 2020 Open Business Meeting. Okay, Commissioner Lachiando, would you care to make this motion, please? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd move to table the award of bid 200478 Ada County Land for wellhead conversion and gas fitting. Purchases 2020 to May 5th, 2020. We have a second. second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you, aye. Bob. Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. All right. Next up, um, thank you for your patience. We have Russ Duke and Kim Link with us. Um, the director, uh, Russ is the director of Central District Health, and Kim Link is the epidemiological manager. I don't know if I said that correctly, but uh, Commissioner Lachiando, do you want to do a better job of introducing our guests today? And then we have a little bit of a presentation for us, which we're really excited about. Great. Well, uh, welcome back, uh, Director Duke and uh, Kim Link. Uh, we've all spent a lot of time together over the last uh, weeks and months. Um, I just thought it was really important for you all to come and share this plan for contact tracing uh, with the larger community this morning. Um, you know, we're all learning a lot in real time about uh, the work that you all do, um, but there's also a fair amount of, of what I call um, sort of being an armchair epidemiologist out there. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity for the experts in the community to come in and share more about their work and the plans as we uh, start to loosen up uh, restrictions in the community. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. With that, um, Russ, I'll turn it over to you and to Kim. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Russ Duke. I've been the director of Central District Health for 15 years. Uh, just by kind of way of who we are and what we do, and I'll be brief, is we're a Fort County local health department. We serve Ada, Boise, Elmore, and Valley. We're governed by a seven-member board. Uh, Commissioner Lachiando is one of the three Ada County board members, along with Drs. Pepperly and, and Young. We're not a state agency. Uh, we're operating on an uh, $11 million annual budget. We get federal money, state money, county money, and fees. And I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation for Ada County's support uh, for our budget. Uh, makes up about 20% of our over, overall budget, and I can't tell you how critically important it is to, to have that commitment uh, from our largest, most populated county in our health district. So, again, thank you for that. We have uh, approximately 120 staff. We provide uh, preventive medical services, uh, reproductive health, immunizations, uh, annual examinations, and so on mental health services, child dental services. Uh, we have uh, over 40,000 visits per year, uh, both within our clinic, as well as we do home visiting services for parenting and for mental health. We do uh, food establishment inspections, ranging from uh, hot dog stand to large grocery stores like Winco, Costco, Albertsons. And Walmart, uh, we inspect child care facilities and public pools. We oversee the installation of septic systems. We have uh, oversight for setting up the fit and fall proof classes for our seniors. We have uh, 27 sites for around 2,700 active participants, and that's for strength and flexibility. We provide tobacco cessation classes, and the list kind of goes on as far as the, the type of work that we do in the community, but it's a, it's a very uh, wide variety of, of work and all focused on promoting and protecting the health of our communities. The two programs most rel relevant to what we have going on today is our public health preparedness program, and they have worked for really for decades on helping our healthcare systems uh, prepare for events like this and working closely with our 
County Emergency Managers. Uh, obviously, Joe's Lombardo is very involved, and we appreciate uh, his partnership. And then we have our disease investigator team. So that's the team that Kim Link leads. And none of what we're doing today is new to us. We deal with outbreaks of all types, foodborne, waterborne, airborne, bloodborne, uh, people to people, animal to people. Uh, so it, it's the type of work we do day in and day out, although certainly the magnitude of this is uh, far more significant. And by way of introduction, I, I know many of you are probably familiar with uh, Johns Hopkins website now. They're doing a fabulous job mapping the disease as it started in the Wuhan province of China and has spread around the world. And it just so happens that uh, Kim has a Master of Science from Johns Hopkins. So I'll end there. And uh, I guess there's time for questions or if you want to wait till the end, but I, I want to turn over the rest of my time to Kim to describe the boots on the ground work that we're doing right now to respond to COVID-19. Thank you, Russ. Kim? Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you for having me today. Um, I've shared my screen. I want to make sure that it's visible to everybody to see my PowerPoint slide. Yes, thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Then with that, I will go ahead and get started. So as we look at COVID-19, I think contact tracing is really the activity that's come to the forefront in looking at the public health response. But it's important to know that this activity is, is part of a larger investigation process. So when a person is diagnosed with COVID, local, local public health receives that report and we conduct a case interview. During that interview, we're collecting information to determine when that person was infectious and who they may have exposed during that time. That information is then used to identify and notify the exposed people, so the contact tracing activity. In addition to notifying individuals, we're also contacting businesses and other facilities where exposures may have occurred. This might include places like that person's place of work, um, other businesses where they may have spent significant periods of time, or places like healthcare facilities and schools. And in our work with each of these places, what we're doing is working with um, organizers and, and supervisors there to determine what that exposure risk was and what level of notification needs to occur. Additionally, we're working with those places to look at what planning they have in place and if there are ways that exposures could be minimized in the future. Also, during the investigation process, we're collecting large amounts of data. And this data is important for our routine reporting to state and federal agencies, but more importantly in this situation, it is, it's important for uh, decision making. And then finally, education, which is an absolutely critical part of our investigation process. So for the person who is sick, we're oftentimes their, their go-to resource to start answering those questions that they thought of since the time that they received the diagnosis. And for the person who's been exposed, we're helping to answer their questions about COVID and how they're going to navigate um, the next two weeks of being in quarantine. In both cases, taking that time to help answer their questions, reassure their fears, and provide information to help them understand why we're asking them to alter their lives is helpful in gaining the buy-in that we need for that to keep the public safe. So it's definitely not every day that the work of an epidemiologist makes national news. We're typically working in the background and we know that we're doing a good job when you're not hearing about the work that we're doing. So in many ways, it's not surprising that the details of our work are new to many people. But as, as Russ mentioned, as Commissioner Latiano mentioned, this is work that's being done by people with specialized training and experience. Here in Idaho, epidemiologists are responsible for investigating over 70 diseases and conditions. And the skills that we're using to investigate cases of COVID are ones that are drawn directly from our day-to-day -day work. And I've included some of those examples here. So now that we talked a little bit about case investigation work, I wanna take a step back and look at how it fits into the bigger picture. We know that no matter what we do, many people are going to get sick. Some people are going to need to be hospitalized and unfortunately some people are going to die. 
one measure of our success in the management of this pandemic is whether all people who require hospitalization are able to do so and receive the correct level of care and be treated by staff who have the adequate PPE to do so safely. There are going to be many ways that communities get this done right, and there are going to be ways that communities get it wrong. As we look at our path to success, there really are three major contributors. That first one is hospital capacity and hospital planning. So what are the hospitals able to do to increase their bed capacity and bolster their PPE supply? The second one is case investigation. So are we in public health able to contact the sick people, find out who their contacts are, and have success in keeping those contacts from potentially um, infecting other people if or when they themselves become infectious? And the third are community-wide measures. These are going to include things like the stay-at-home orders, but they also include personal responsibility items like social distancing and wearing a face mask while out in public. So in the end, hospitals play their role of making beds and staff available, but it's going to be the role of public health and the community working together to make sure that we don't have too many people getting sick all at the same time causing hospitals to become overwhelmed. With all that in mind, this last slide that I have shows our case investigation surge capacity plan. Right now, with having the stay at, home, stay at home order in place for about a month, we're comfortably operating at level one. We're receiving only a couple of case reports every day at this point, which from an overall illness standpoint is great. Very few people are getting sick right now. But we know that this is going on in the setting of a stay-at-home order. So being at level one is not something that we can do for the long run. It's just not a sustainable place to be. On the other end of the spectrum is level three. And we realize that as it was public health, we can continue to add capacity to do these case investigations. But again, we're going to reach a point where the number of people who are getting sick and need hospitalization is going to outstrip our hospital capacity. So based on our current hospital capacity, the personal protective equipment situation, and knowing that our hospitals in Ada County are the major source of ICU beds for a geographic region that spans from central Idaho to eastern Oregon, we feel that operating at level three for any length of time would end up severely straining our hospitals. So with new case reports being as low as they are, we're taking this time to prepare to boost our capacity to spend long stretches of time working at level two. If we find that the daily case reports are starting to jump up and to the point that we're, we're looking at that level three uh, capacity, that's going to be an indicator that more strict community mitigation strategies and community-wide actions are needed to quickly slow that outbreak down. And putting these measures in place will allow us to decrease the number of people who are infectious in our community. It's going to allow the hospitals to start discharging more patients than they're admitting and also give them an opportunity to recharge depleted PPE supplies. So in the end, we don't know how long we're going to have to deal with this virus, but we're positioning ourselves to work through the ebb and flow of it potentially for the next 12 to 18 months. And that's all the information I have to share. Uh, Madam Chair, if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kim. I have a, I'll start out with a quick question. So we've talked about herd immunity before and, and the goal of obtaining herd immunity. So how are you trying to balance the goal of herd immunity with hospital capacity? Well, I think that herd immunity is it's something that we're hoping for, but with this virus being so new, we don't necessarily know that people who've been infected have long-term immunity. Um, again, this is something that we're very hopeful for. But I think in terms of looking at this successfully and, and going back to our goal that every patient who needs to be hospitalized has a bed available to them, um, trying to, I think, keep the outbreak in check, but allowing society to run as much as possible so that we have people who are out. We know that people are going to get sick. Most people are going to recover without any long-term concerns, uh, but ensuring that 
if a, if a person needs a hospital bed, they have a hospital bed. So I think it's going to be a give and take. And again, moving through these different levels of our surge capacity, moving through different levels of community mitigation strategies um, to, to keep the overall number of people getting sick at any one point in time as much in check as possible. Does that answer your question? It does. So it sounds like we just don't know enough about the virus yet to know whether, um, like some forms of flu, that it will continue to mutate. And so we may not be immune um, moving forward to something we would be immune to today. Is that correct? That's correct. I think the, what the science is showing right now is that developing a vaccine to this virus is looking very promising. So, you know, I think from my standpoint, I'm hopeful that we'll at least see some um, shorter term immunity, if not long term immunity, that will keep us from having people continually reinfected um, and that we move through this as best we can. Um, to prevent severe outcomes whenever possible uh, until the point that we can get a vaccine out on the market. Great questions. I can't see folks on the, on the screen because of the PowerPoint, so you'll just have to go ahead and speak up. I don't have questions. I'm happy to defer to Commissioner Malloy or anyone else who has a question. I think Phil McGrain. No, yeah, let's go ahead. We have um, we have Clerk McGrain here, ready for a question. We'll start with him. Uh, um, I'm just curious. I know we've had conversations off to the side. Commissioner Lachiano has kind of led the effort, um, but do you anticipate that you'll need some additional, you know, temporary assistance with that contact tracing, either doing the interviews or even some of the data entry that's referenced on the screen? That's a great question, and I think the, the easy answer is yes. Uh, right now, looking at positioning ourselves for the long term, we realize, again, this is something that we might have to deal with for the next 12 to 18 months. So um, we're, we're positioning ourselves to hire in temp staff to take on a lot of that heavy lifting. But we also recognize that there's, there's going to be times where we do need additional staff. People are going to want to take vacations. Um, and having uh, whether or not that, that staff who are trained to come in, say, from the county, um, from our different cities, from our medical reserve board, that's also a component that we're working on. So as far as what our planning process is, is looking like right now, we're focusing on getting going through that 10 staff hiring process, but we also plan on uh, making that ask for additional volunteers or staff who might be in a position where they want to help, they're able to help, but they can't necessarily make those longer term commitments. Okay, great. I think we've identified some folks within our team who do medical interviews already uh, that I think we can at least in, in intermittent or temporary surges uh, provide some assistance. So once you get to that point, just let us know. Perfect. I think the uh, important thing here, if I may, Madam Chair, yeah, sure, Kim. If you um, Kim, if you stop sharing your PowerPoint, then we can see everybody, everyone, and I can tell um, when folks are wanting to ask a question. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. Okay, Commissioner Lachiando. You know what was really helpful for me was um, uh, Director Duke explaining to me that we need to sort of have in position essentially a national guard of of public health and contact tracing in our community. Um, we don't need to be, you know, have people waiting around doing nothing at level three, but if we have additional public employees who are trained ahead of time, um, who can then be called upon if a, there's a little bit of a case surge to do this work, um, that's going to put us in a good position to do this effectively. So just really, um, you know, appreciate that explanation as well as um, all the staff and Phil's team included who are working to identify people who might serve in that capacity. Thank you. Questions? Looks like Commissioner Malloy. Madam Chair, um, I know the public has a big concern in that a lot of these testing locations or groups are not their regular health care provider. They're not their regular doctor. Um, what kind of one uh, guidelines are we ensuring for patient privacy and then public, I think public education on that issue uh, that may cause reluctancy for people to want to be even tested. I, 
I think that's an interesting question. And I, as we look at this, even through the drive-through testing or these different um, initiatives that are going on, it's important to remember that uh, this is still health information. Everything is being protected by HIPAA and uh, people are operating in that regard. Um, and looking at testing overall, that's something that we at the health district are working closely with um, the healthcare community through one of our liaisons to um, try to bring that process together and get information out as much as possible for people to know where they can receive testing. Um, if there are healthcare providers who are interested in testing that they may not have supplies or information, we're working with them as much as possible as well. And that given that if the counties are doing this or the healthcare districts under the counties are taxpayer supported, will there still be billing or uh, trying to bill healthcare providers for reimbursement of the costs of this testing? I, I will admit that's an area that I'm not as familiar with. I, I've been focusing more on the case investigation component. Um, Russ, do you by chance have more information as far as what the what the billing process is looking like and what safeguards are in place? Yeah, sure. So I guess are you looking at when you speak about the public health district, like our health district being funded by the counties, is that what you're referring to as far as our billing practices or out further in the community like family medicine residency or primary health medical group, St. Luke's, et cetera? Well the the this, you know, primary health, St. Luke's are, I mean, are standalone, um, you know, medical organizations is, are the, uh, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing pieces of information in this, are the medical entities that are taxpayer supported also seeking reimbursement for the costs and stuff of these tests through the uh, individual's medical Healthcare provider, or will be. Madam Chair, Mr. Lachiano. So I guess it's important to note Central District Health doesn't do COVID testing. Um, that's being conducted by a whole host of different entities. What Central District Health does, and correct me if I have this incorrect, Russ, um, they get the reporting from all of those tests. All of the healthcare providers are required to report into the the system so that Central District Health can do their part to conduct the disease investigation. That's the piece that I didn't have. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Russ or Kim, either one, um, I think it would be helpful to clear up under the new governor's order, um, we have the business uh, sort of rollout plans, reopen Idaho. And it talks about those plans being approved, but um, I think there might be some confusion on whether your department uh, is going to approve those plans or if anyone at all will be approving those plans. Could you speak to that? Sure, Madam Chair. The, the plans that we're actually going to be reviewing and approving are for the licensed food establishment. So we have about 3,000 of those in our health district, most of them here in Ada County. So, we have a process in place where they'll submit the plan to us through a, through an email link. We'll review those plans and then we'll respond back to the uh, whoever submitted them, the owner or the manager, letting them know we approve them or if we have questions or concerns, then we'll have to correspond with them. So we'll provide that guidance and technical assistance for everyone else, uh, including like schools and childcare, a lot of the non-essential businesses that will be coming back online, we're going to provide technical assistance to them. We'll look at their plans if they would like us to, but we're not going to go through any type of approval process. And it's just, you know, that would logistically it'd be impossible. But uh, we've actually been doing that all along, even with the central businesses where we're providing technical assistance and helping them uh, follow CDC's guidance. Thank you for that clarification. Any further questions? Anyone in the audience here? No, any questions on the bridge? Thank you so much, Russ and Kim. We really appreciate you being here with us today and taking the time. We know that you are super, super busy, um, but it's really uh, most appreciative and 
I think we have you streaming on YouTube as well as a couple of hopefully television stations are picking this up and we'll continue to share your information and education with the public. So once again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, next up, emergency health pay discussion. Cassie, come on up. Cassie, do you want to go ahead and just, um, good morning, how are you? Good. Good, just give us a quick overview. The there we go. Give us a quick overview. I love the meeting. <laughs> and then we'll ask any questions that we may have. I think Commissioner Malloy may have a couple. Right. Absolutely. So back on in May 16th, when we initially started asking people to go home. You have to speak up. I can't Sorry. hear very well. Uh, back on March 16th, when we initially started asking employees to go home and work from home and do the social distancing, the board put into place the emergency health pay, covering a six different reasons why individuals and employees would be covered for this pay. Uh, and primarily, it was to encourage employees who were ill to not come to work. Um, we didn't want them to come to work due to financial concerns. So that was implemented. It's been in place. Um, does exhaust um, or is only approved through this Saturday um, with the governor's orders um, looking at a phased approach of potentially moving away from emergency health pay but ensuring that we're still having our employees um, encouraged to stay home when they need to. So um, there's been some discussion, of course this is up to the board, um, extending that emergency health pay through phase one since there's still a lot of closures currently. And then, thank you. And then um, once that ends, we will still, a lot of employees will still be eligible for the Families First Act, which does provide some financial assistance um, for if they're experiencing symptoms, caring for someone who's experiencing symptoms, quarantined, and for the child care as well. We currently so under the Family First Act, is there a little bit more stricter reporting requirements? And if so, can you go through, walk through those with us? Yes, um, there, is, there are stricter requirements. Um, so I've gone through each of the six different reasons that we have emergency health pay and kind of tried to marry that with the Families First Act. Um, if someone has symptoms, they do have to actively be seeking a diagnosis um, that is required under Family First. Um, you can care, you can stay home to care for someone, but it's not just if they're symptomatic. They have to have been ordered, self-quarantined by either a government order or a doctor's order or something to that effect. Um, if they're out for childcare, they are required to provide the name of the child as well as the facility that the child would have normally been um, attending. Um, for the quarantine, people can't just self-quarantine. They have to have a doctor who's telling them. So for high risk, right now we're allowing people to kind of self-select out for high risk. We would need a doctor to, to validate that risk and be putting them under self-quarantine. So there are stricter guidelines, but there is some coverage still. Also, Families First does only cover 80 hours or two weeks of pay, and then they would no longer be eligible for that. They would be required to use their sick and vacation time after that. Okay. Anything else? It's done? Not but, from me, unless there's questions. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Malloy, we should let you end out questions for Cassie. Madam Chair. Commissioner Malloy. Could you re explain the, the child care, the, the children simply being out of school? does qualify them under Family First? Is that what I heard? It does as long as there's no other reasonable means for child care. So they do, it's it's up to the employee to tell us that. We don't go investigate, but if, if the employee says, well, my spouse is also home, I just prefer to be the one who helps with the schooling, that wouldn't technically qualify under Family First because there's another adult in the house to care for the child. Um, but typically as long as it's COVID related closure. So it could be daycare. It can be that your um, primary care provider is being self quarantined by a doctor. All of those reasons would qualify for the um, emergency FMLA. Okay. And then up, up to this point, all this has been under the CARES, which is expiring. So now we're going to just the general family, families first or FMLA if, if they truly have a, a person that is ill or sick. And then do those programs keep them at their full salary if they're out and unable to work? So for the, the two leaves that are for, or the leaves that cover exposure, quarantine, um, 
being symptomatic, those are at full pay. <clears throat> Families First only requires that we pay uh, people out for childcare two thirds of their wage, um, but I would advocate just for the um, simplicity of administration that we keep them at full pay. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Any further questions? So Cassie, do we have an idea of um, how many folks? We have almost 2,000 employees, and we've sort of talked about um, maybe having to set up our own child care at some point. Um, is there a, a way to do an assessment or a survey and really sort of ascertain what that need is within the county? And so even though daycares are open, I think there's going to be a lot of issues that continue to arise. Um, Madam Chair, we have, we have been designating EFMLA when we're aware of it um, because of the job protection that is available with it. So we have approximately 45 individuals that we've designated under EFMLA currently, um, but I have not, the Sheriff's Office, um, I spoke with our HR person yesterday, but I, they didn't have an exact number yet. They're working on getting it for me, but they weren't able to prepare for today. Okay, okay. So is there anything that you're recommending for today that, um, that we need to cover folks? Uh, we need a decision for the emergency health pay. Um, currently, it's set to end on Saturday. So the question, question we're posing to the board would be, would you like to extend that until the end of phase one, um, preferably May 16th, so it covers the entire pay period <laughs> or the entire work week. And then the FMLA would kick in. Um, and then, yes, the families first would be available to the employees after that, and then sick and vacation from there. Okay, so through the 16th. All right, any further questions for Cassie? If not, a motion. Madam Chair. Yeah. Madam Chair. Hold on one second, Commissioner Lachiondo. I sure. just want I just want to clarify. So what we're talking about is extending what we have been doing through phase one or, or through May 16th, which I strongly agree with the pay period thing. Um, uh, and then shifting, we'll have time obviously to communicate another, but then shifting to matching up with the families first after that as we re and in theory that shouldn't be too big because we'll be reintroducing employees back to the office and getting some of these people back to work yes. right gotcha. I, wouldn't really say I just okay I, i'm just <laughs> confirming so that whatever I whatever we decide here today we'll communicate that either today or tomorrow uh, understood i was just trying to make sure i was keeping up yeah. thanks yeah, thank and you. Uh, yeah commissioner lachiondo i'm ready to make a motion but before i do i think the important thing to note here is that while the governor's phases have some uh, dates set out with them, they're still conditional based on the data, for example, from what we just heard from Central District Health on the ground. So if we do not uh, continue to see those downward trends, um, May 16th may not be uh, the date that, uh, that we're moving to phase two. So we can set out May 16th as a target, we just need to be careful um, about how we message this. Yeah, that's that's correct. This is an ongoing day-to-day -day assessment and analysis, <laughs> it looks like. Commissioner Malloy? Uh, my, my question is, having not seen the, the plan or the directive, is it, are we voting to approve this at full pay when they are unable to perform any of their, their duties from home? That's, that's what the, we would ask Commissioner Lachiando to make a motion. And if that's the motion or two thirds pay, I don't know what motion she's gonna make yet. So as soon as she does, then we'll discuss that. So, so from the point of discussion, my, my concern is, is the inequity in, we do have people working remotely and performing their duties and, and clearly have no issue with them receiving their pay because they're able to perform their duties. I, I do not see that. It's equitable if we have people away, unable to perform any of their duties and still receiving full pay. So if we followed the plan specifically at the two thirds pay, I have no issues with approving this, but I, but that, that inequity is a hurdle that's hard for me to get over. Cassie, would you like to speak to that? Um, currently we have uh, 48 employees who are out due to lack of work again, excluding the sheriff's office. Um, I, I just have unknown numbers for them. And then we have 73 people who are receiving the pay due to the limited work based on rotating schedules. So um, for example, juvenile court services has detention officers and they've divided them into teams to limit exposure in case 
there was an exposure at work, they could take the whole team off and quarantine them and there would still be enough backfill to um, be available to continue to uh, provide the services at the same level they do now. So, so they're, they're being mandated to do that. So they're being mandated, they're working partially. So they are working some hours and then some hours they're on um, the emergency health paid, so they're made whole. Okay, and then a few of those, these folks are clerks from your clerk's office. Is any, anything you'd wanna help clarify for Commissioner Malloy? on the two-thirds pay versus 100%? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have anything to add to that. I, I do support uh, what Cassie's recommendations are that based on how we have had it structured, I think continuing it through this phase one, that gives us ample time. I think if we have that lead time to communicate the changes going to the two-thirds pay uh, after the 16th, that will afford people the opportunity to try and figure out if they can Come up with creative child care. I mean, school closures is one of the is the biggest impact. Um, so hopefully, this will afford that. Me being able to communicate that will help us transition. Plus, we are, and I've had this conversation with Cassie, trying to push to get these people back in and encouraging people to figure out child care. So I think whatever that is, because I mean, Judge Moody is sitting here not far from me, and one of her biggest hurdles is my office being able to staff. So we're pushing that. I know it, it's a limited number, but we do have, um, just by the nature of the type of people I employ, um, the child care impacts our office greater than it does many of the other offices. So the only ones we'd be concerned about are the ones that we're mandating to stay home? Um, and how many folks? Um, we have 48 that are, at, that are home full-time right now and 73 that are partial um, and my hope is with the phase although understanding the phase two may not happen exactly on May 16th is that with phase two a lot of those employees would be able to, to return to some level of work oh they would okay so you don't see that continuing hoping not hoping, I, yeah, I don't know yeah. all the plans I know yet. we don't have a crystal ball <laughs> but yeah we're trying to trying to make some decisions here Chairman. sure go ahead Commissioner this, this is an extent you'd be asking for an extension to May 16th for the pay period of three then. Correct. Yeah. All right. I will, uh, in, in the discussion, I will defer to the wisdom of those that are more informed on this. <laughs> Commissioner Lachiondo, are you ready to make a motion? I am. Um, I think, um, I think Commissioner Malloy's concerns are well placed. I think this is a, a balancing act between trying to keep everybody healthy and safe and recognize that um, certainly we have small businesses out there who um, have laid off workers, et cetera. Um, that being said, I think we're uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, about to get back to a place, um, you know, post May 16th where we're kind of rocking and rolling and uh, we need to have people kind of hyped up and ready to do that. So I will make a motion to continue the emergency health play health pay uh, framework um, as presented through May 16th, um, of course, depending on uh, phasing um, per the governor. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Okay, the ayes have it. Motion carries. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go into recess. Thank you, everyone. We'll take it up in legal. All right, we're back on the record. It's Thursday, April 30th, and the time is 10.15 a.m. Board of 80 County Commissioners is in session for Emergency Medical Services District meeting. We have Commissioner Lachianda with us today. Uh, no one else is in the room with us today, so we'll go ahead and I'll ask if there's any changes to this agenda, Madam Clerk. No, there are not. 
Seeing no changes, we'll take up new business and I'll need a motion for the claims journal. Okay, yes, Madam Chair, I move to ratify the authorization made on Tuesday, April 28, 2020 to pay the claims on the claims journal dated April 24th, 2020 regarding EMS expenditures. I'll second that. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Aye, guys, have a motion carries. Next, I need a motion on personal action forms. Madam Chair, I move to approve the personal action forms as listed on the agenda, including one leave with pay, and then the summary sheet remain on file in the commissioner's office. I'll second that. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next step, I'll need a motion for approval of minutes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the minutes as identified on the agenda and authorize the chair to sign the documents on behalf of the board. I'll second that. All those in favor, state aye. 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 Ayes have it. Motion carries. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go into recess. Thank you.